his skin. Hues of gold and black, bronze, brown, caramel to cream. My melanin determining the intricate details of my overall theme. Pulls resilient and bold from roots of afro textured, natural and wavy mane. An expression of my uniquely individual style. <laughs> and it's a black thing. Cocoa butter saturated, sealed with moisture. Hydrating my melanin to rich skin. A gift from my ancestors. To the coils and cocoa butter podcast. Hey, coils and cocoa butter spam. Do me a quick favor subscribe to the channel, like this video. And share it if it has blessed you, if you've learned something from it, or you really think a family or friend could benefit from the dialogue. Also, head on over to Shades of Brown's newest website, www.lovingmyshadesofbrown.com, where you'll be updated on the newest events that we got coming up, where you'll be able to buy merchandise at the Hope at Midnight store, and you'll also meet the visionaries behind the mission of uplifting the kingdom and promoting the culture. Hey y'all. Hey, welcome to the Quills and Cocoa Butter Podcast. If this is your first time joining us, if you are returning, hey, welcome back. I'm your host, Jazz. Um, today we're gonna jump right on in. I'm gonna be talking about um therapy one-on-one. So if you are someone that is seeking therapy, um, but don't know where to start or someone who might think like, Hey, I might need to go to therapy. Um, but it might have some anxieties about what the process would be like. Um, this is going to be for you. Um, I know that this could go in so many different directions. We could kind of talk about the myths of therapy or some of the cultural implications that have historically, um, limited black people's exposure to therapy um but i want to stay in this episode specifically geared to is people who you know are like really interested in going but don't know where to start um i'll definitely touch on other things in future episodes if you guys would like me to um but with starting shades of brown and, and the quilts and cocoa butter podcast is so important to me as a clinician of color to um have these conversations because there have historically been so many negative connotations and stereotypes as it relates to mental health. And I recognize so many of our people are not going to step into a therapy room, but I hope to encourage you guys to, as you see, um, at not only myself, but as I bring in other clinicians of color, and you see that we are regular people um, who deal with regular issues. We are approachable, but we are working on us. And therapy is a, a, a beautiful vessel um, that we have been given. So I hope to open the door for, for other people um, who are considering it. Um, so I'm going to use my position in this podcast and as I do my community events as a professional to bring information to you. But as always, I want to make it clear that this is not therapy and I am not your therapist. Although I am sure I would love to be, but I'm not. Um, so I have my notes with me just in case you see me looking down. I, I want to attend to you guys, but I also want to give you all the information um, and not forget anything, which I'm sure I will anyway, but let's jump on into it. So, um, the first thing, if you are interested in therapy, will obviously be finding a therapist. So what does that process look like? Um, how do you find a therapist? So it could be a lot of different ways that you could look for a therapist. A lot of people like would naturally go to family or friends who, you know, they, they know has a therapist or just in conversation, it might come up. Um, and somebody might refer you like, oh, like, yeah, I got a therapist. Um, that's a great avenue, but with all things, I would just caution you to be careful about who you say is your truth to and exactly what you share, um, because you want to make sure that you're talking to somebody that you trust and that you, um, feel comfortable with sharing those type of things with. Um, the last thing we would hope is that like you would approach somebody who 
makes you feel some type of way about the situation or you feel like you overshared and now you feel vulnerable or you know and that turns you away from wanting to seek help because of the person you approach so in everything i will always say speak to people who you trust and who you know have your best interests um Another way you can find a therapist if you have an employer who has an employee assistance program. I think that's a great avenue. Um, generally, under the EAP, um, which is the employee assistance program, um, they can they have a set amount of sessions that you can do for free under your your established care plan um, with a therapist. Um, everything is still confidential the employer might require some type of information just to verify that you're going which i'm not totally sure do not hold me to that because i don't know exactly but that's definitely a question that you can ask or contact your eap they generally have a certain amount of sessions that will you will be available to do for free um and if you needed to continue therapy um they can you know refer you out if if need be so that's another avenue that you can use to find a therapist. Um, local and community resources is a good is a good avenue to seek as well. Um, if you know like an advocacy group or you know a social service um, organization that works with specific populations, maybe like domestic violence or you know whatever you feel like your 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 issue might be, your presenting problem might be, um, maybe even just seeking out those agencies because typically a lot of those agencies, especially the bigger ones, work with a lot of different companies and can refer you to a good therapist. Um, another one, if you wanted to do it yourself and begin to search yourself is using the online database, databases. Um, the Amer American Psychological Association is a good one. Um, a lot of therapists and counselors are registered under the APA, so um, that would be a, a really good way to find some therapists. Um, another excellent one that I tend to use myself is um, Psychology Today. So Psychology Today, um, you can look for different therapists in your area. You can search based on radius. You can search um, based on like race or language that they speak or therapy modalities that they use, um, if that's important to you as well. So that's another one. And then you can, uh, on Psychology Today, I'm not quite sure about APA, um, but you can like see their pictures and you can kind of, like fill them out a little bit and see a little bio on them so i always like psychology today um for myself when i'm looking for therapists and of course another avenue that i use a lot when i'm looking for therapists is and maybe the first one you might want to try if you have um insurance is to go through your insurance company so i typically and I always tell my clients like look on the back of your insurance card and look for the customer service information um, to call your insurance company and put them to work. That's their job. So ask questions like, hey, I'm seeking a therapist. Um, and they can search based on the radius and they can send you in-network providers. So that, what does that mean to you? Is that they accept your insurance. So you can kind of skip the skip some of the hustle and bustle of having to find therapists that accept your insurance if you go directly through your insurance company. I would still caution you to still, once you call, even if they say they're in-network, Network and they and you found them based on your insurance to still make sure that they are in network and to find out information um, as it relates to like payment and everything before you start um so yeah those are some like general ways to find a therapist if you are looking um, so once you begin this process and you are looking at therapists, your own psychology today your own APA whatever um, you are going to see some different licenses oh my gosh so first thing do your best to not get overwhelmed <sighs> take a deep breath it'll be all right so there are different licenses that you can get as a clinician so I say that because you can be a social worker you can be a psychologist or you can be like me a counselor um, I'm an LPC which is a licensed professional um, counselor um, I went to school for counseling. I didn't go to school for social work. Whereas somebody who has an LSW is a licensed social worker. Um, they went to school for social work. 
Um, you can be a, a therapist under that social worker designation. You can be a therapist under a psychology designation. You can be a therapist under a counselor's designation. So the licenses pretty much um, vary based on what you went to school for and what your specialty is and what level of degree you have. So like if you have a... a bachelor's degree if you have a master's degree if you have a doctoral degree so those licenses basically say say those things um they also would say if they are independently licensed to practice um so like lisw means licensed independent social worker um you might also run into um like CDCA, um, which is a chemical dependency counselor and assistant, or like LICDC, licensed independent chemical dependency counselor. Um, so these are all different licenses that people can have. You might run into like MSW, which is a master's of social work, um, MA, master's um, of arts, like it's all degree stuff. And also as it relates to these licenses that I just went over, um, I'm speaking from a perspective of someone that is in the state of Ohio. It does vary and the licenses are slightly different, called different things depending on what state you in, you're in. in. To add a little bit more confusion to the mix. But just know generally everything is describing the same thing, but depending on what state you're in, the licenses might be called something a little bit different. That's just the long and the short of it. I have not gone into detail, but that is generally some of the stuff that you will see. Um, another thing that I think is important to distinguish between in, in searching for your therapist or just understanding for yourself is the difference between a psychiatrist and a psychologist. So psychologists um, that counsel, you'll, you'll usually see like PsyD. P-S-Y-D, so that means like a doctoral degree in psychology. Um, they are psychologists. Now, a psychiatrist is a medical doctor who specializes in mental health. So they'll be the ones that you that can prescribe you me. And generally, they don't and typically do therapy, but they could. But generally, medical doctors don't. Um, but they usually work hand in hand, especially in clinical settings. If you work and go to community based um, therapy, that's they'll work hand in hand with the therapist as well. Um, maybe that's something else you want to consider is like if you're going to go to a private practice versus a community based um, therapy session. There are benefits to both um, and maybe some drawbacks to, to both. Um, it's really just the, depending on your preference. Um, private practice tends to be a little bit smaller. Um, the clinicians maybe like generally may, I mean, this might be a little bit of a bias, but have a little bit more autonomy in what they do and how they manage clients just because they don't have like this big organization that they typically have to answer to. Um, but the benefit sometimes of going to community base is that you get a lot, you can like, a lot of these places have, you can get your therapy and you can get your meds in the same place, whereas some private practices don't have that because they don't have a medical prescriber and a psychiatrist on site. So it's really just depending upon what you want. You can always go to a private practice and if you feel like you need meds or you guys discuss it and you're working in therapy and you feel like meds will benefit you, you can always go to a, a, a provider outside of your therapy. It doesn't have to be intertwined. That is just sometimes a benefit um, of the bigger agencies. They usually have a little bit more services available like at their disposal um, because of their size. Um, so those are just some of the things like to consider when you are looking for a therapist and some of the things that you will run into. Um, but you know, just be as informed as possible. Try to not feel overwhelmed with the process. Um, there are so many different licenses. There are so many, um, dif different designations, but always ask questions. It's okay. Just ask questions if you don't understand. Um, Another thing that you um, want to look into or you might see when you are looking for a therapist are the different treatment modalities or the, the things that they um, say that they specialize in. So, for example, they can say that they work um, 
with the LGBTQ community. They can say that they specialize in um, depression work or family work um, or e EMDR. Like you'll see a lot of different treatment modalities. And honestly, if you're starting out or even if you've been in therapy, that might not, not mean too much of anything to you if you don't understand what the treatment modality is. But something that you want to make sure as you um, go through this process and you interview your therapist and um, you're having dialogues with them, you do want to kind of understand what treatment modalities that they utilize and make sure that they are evidence-based. So what does that mean? That means that they have been empirically supported and tested to make sure that they are effective in whatever the issues that you are seeking is. So for example, like has um, cognitive behavioral therapy been proven effective in treating depression or not? So whatever treatment modality that um, your therapist subscribes to you want to make sure that it's empirically supported and that's something that's super important in working with professional clinicians that we have a code of ethics that we have to uphold to make sure that we are doing no harm to our client that we can't just say like hey we just want to test this out on you and you know and and we know that we can be not helping like we have to make sure that we are doing our due diligence in um the treatment modalities that we utilize and just to get on my soapbox for a second because i am a professional clinician um that is some of my problem and some of my fear because there are so many great people out here who are not licensed who have so much wisdom and are just so in tune and I'm not saying you can only receive from someone who is degreed but I'm saying that it's something that I will caution you on and going to somebody who says that they are just a life coach or you know um someone who does not have that um backing because like we have a code of ethics that our licenses hold us to so if we aren't doing harm to clients we can be sued like we can we can be held accountable if you go to somebody who is not licensed they can't be held accountable on the same level so just be careful because your mental health is not anything to play with and you don't your health holistically is not nothing to play with so you wouldn't want to just go to somebody who wasn't trained to do you know give you your meds like whatever so you want to make sure you go to somebody that's trained and a good clinician should be able to be comfortable explaining to you what the process is this is not a secret this is your treatment so you should be informed you should be informed as to what's going on what do you think is going to work um why why are we going to do this you know ask some questions and that might be further down the road you know not your first session or you know whatever but it's that it's something to to inform yourself and be um kind of in the know and prepare for that um so once you get your foot in the door you found a therapist um your first session what is that going to look like um so generally screening and assessment is done like together um the screening is generally just to to screen for the presence of a problem basically to see if you even have something going on um and then the assessment is to it's more so to determine the nature of the problem or the diagnose and the treatment plan and to get more detail once it is verified that you have something that like yeah we can work with this um but generally they're done together um not a, not a big deal to like really understand and distinguish you know when you're doing screening or assessments um but for your first session um i would say expect a longer day <laughs> when you go to your first session um they're going to collect a whole bunch of information you're going to sign a whole lot of papers in your first session um a lot of those papers have to do with like uh, uh, confidentiality and hipaa um payment insurance just all of those type of things um confidentiality I'm gonna go there for a second is vital okay in in what we do it's already hard enough for so many people to feel comfortable to come to therapy so just imagine if we could just go out and tell people your business like nobody would do it and it, it, it's it's not ethical so um just understanding confidentiality is a necessary piece of therapy so when you walk in that door um you can understand that what have what what you say to your therapist is going to be between you and your therapist unless 
unless there are some um, things that like we have to report. So if you say that you have plans to harm yourself or anyone else. So that means if you are actively suicidal, you have plan, you have intent to harm yourself. We have to make sure that we, we keep you safe and we are doing our due diligence as professionals to keep you safe. If you have plans to harm someone else, if you have plan and intent to go kill somebody like you can't, you know, we got to make sure you keep yourself safe um, and other people safe as well. If um, a child um, or an elder is being abused or neglected, we also have to, to report those things. Um, typically, clinicians, I would say um, myself and other clinicians and professionals that I work with, it's not going to be a big secret. Um, if they do have any concerns, they'll, they'll dog, dialogue with you and come up with a safe way for us to share with safe people what needs to happen. So even in those spaces, don't feel attacked or don't feel like, oh, well, I can't talk to my clinician clinicians will have your best interest at hand so those are the only um reasons why confidentiality can be breached um so like i said it's going to be a lot of data collection in in the assessment the initial assessment so they're going to ask a lot of demographic information ask a lot about your medical history ask about your family history um ask about like maybe like your presenting problems and what brought you in like why do you feel like you want to start therapy right now just kind of see where your goals and, and, and your intentions are um some of the things that they might ask you like um maybe also include like have you ever been to therapy before is this your first time um about other specific treatment places that you have been and this is all super relevant not only just for insurance purposes and because it's required for insurance purposes um but also for for your therapist to get an understanding of who you are and a in a paint a bigger, bigger picture so for example if they ask you about medical history and you're given all of this, you know, long list, laundry list of medical things that you have wrong with you, but you are presented with depression and anxiety. It is so possible that you have something that medically is contributing to your impression, your depression or anxiety. So it's no reason for us to sit here and try to like not look at the at it holistically like hey well you said that you got this that and the third have you gotten addressed oh you haven't been to the doctor in 10 years well let's talk about that like maybe you need to go to the doctor um so and that's that's what what so many things contribute to mental health like what we eat what we drink if you're drinking caffeine but you're anxious all the time like let's get into it so i know it could it maybe feels like a lot of information being shared like why am i sharing all of this information but it's it's part of the bigger picture like you don't just show up mental health by itself like everything contributes to who we are holistically so being able to get that bigger picture is so important and plus it is a rapport building thing we um get to know you a little bit bit better which is great um I would say, and, and also like you might start establishing your goals. Like you tell your therapist, like what you intend to get out of therapy. Um, we want to make sure that your goals are measurable. So that allows us to, um, to say like where we started and if we reassess in three months or if we reassess in, you know, a month, um, are you getting better? And if not, like, do we need to adjust or like what's working, what's not working? And, um, so it gives us a good starting point, you know, with the, the, the initial assessment. So it can feel like a lot of information is being shared, but just once again, breathe in and let's, let's just, let's do it. Let's do it because this is what you came for. This is for your healing. So share as honestly as possible. I know it might feel a little bit uncomfortable. Um, and, and hopefully you'll get to the point where you like, you feel a little bit more comfortable sharing openly, um, with your clinician. But definitely plan for a longer day. Um, make sure you bring your ID, your insurance card. Um, and probably when you're scheduling the sessions, you just want to make sure specifically ask them what they need you to bring so you'll be prepared. Also, um, some tips maybe that I would give you like uh, about doing your initial assessment is that this is kind of a two-way interview. Like you're kind of filling out your therapist as well. Like um, during this process, 
um, you kind of just want to like make sure like are they do they seem attentive to you um, are they giving you feedback or you know do, do you feel like they're engaging with you now I will say it can be hard especially the depending on type of setting that you're in it might feel a little bit rushed like I will always pre apologize to clients um, when we were working short or it was just a lot going on like so typically like in my last job I had typically 65 clients at a time plus we had to do intakes plus we had all these other assessments that we had to do for the day and we would generally do intakes for people that we weren't even going to be the counselor for so I want to make sure people stay in a safe place I don't want you to have to overshare with me and I'm not going to be your clinician you just release everything and now you feel like oh my god now she ain't even gonna be my counselor so I would literally only collect what's needed and I would tell them ahead of time you know like hey this is what it is um but so maybe even asking a question like are you going to be my therapist because depending on the type of setting you work in you might have an intake and assessment department so they might not even be your long-term therapist they might literally only be doing your assessments so um that might be a good question to ask as well um and but it is a two-way interview But I would just say, even if the person, so say for instance, the person who is doing your intake and assessment is going to be your therapist and you just not feeling them like that. Like on this first session, I ain't feeling dude. I'm not feeling ma'am. I'm not feeling sis. Like I always say, give it a try. So it's nothing written in stone or, or, or like, I'm not saying it's based on any data or anything that I read, but I always tell people, give it at least three solid sessions and maybe not even counting the intake to get a feel for your clinician. Um, I say that because number one, like our first perception is not always going to be like who people are. And when I'm collecting a whole bunch of information, I can't really get into it. I just got to check these boxes and get this information down. So I'm really not even giving you all I got yet so I don't I definitely don't think the initial assessment is a good time to make the can I really mess with do or ma'am um but but these are some of the things that you definitely want to consider as you keep going like are they in tune in with me are they reflecting do that do I feel like I'm getting a, a, a good rapport with them um I had a client who did not mess with me not because of me but like this client was basically like I've been in and out of therapy and in and out of social service stuff for years and I know I know it I know I know what I'm supposed to do I know how the situation gonna work I'm just not feeling it it's not you it's me type of situation but it was mandatory that I saw this person so I'm like okay well give me all you got like how long you got to meet with me today Five minutes, Jasmine. (laughs) This client will come into my office and sit for five minutes. At four minutes and 59 seconds, she grabbing the stuff. Like, all right, you done with me? And I worked with that. I worked with that because I knew that that's where this client's comfort zone was at. So um, that five minutes eventually turned into 10 minutes. And that 10 minutes eventually turned into 15 minutes. So by the time I was leaving this organization, this client was meeting with me for an hour, hour and a half. When they, this client would see me out and about and, you know, in the facility, oh, start conversations, initiating conversations because we built that rapport. So this rapport is something that's so important in the therapeutic process that client counselor rapport you being able to feel like I can talk to this person this person really values me um they care about me and it's something that might not even come overnight and you have to give it time and it might not be honestly y'all I'm gonna be real with y'all it might not even be the clinician it could be some of your past traumas or some of your defense mechanisms you know like I know for myself I have a difficulty being vulnerable so if I come into a situation where I feel uncomfortable I'm already putting my wall up so I could take a little bit more time to warm up to people and I know because I know that about myself I tend to have to give people a little bit more time to to for me to feel comfortable with them or for them to even get to know who I am like I was at a job where I was an advocate for um 
people with disabilities and my supervisor said like it took her like a year to really even get to know my personality because that first year I'm filling stuff out I was straight out of undergrad it's my first real job in the field I'm trying to do everything right but then once I knew the job I start Jasmine's personality started coming out they're like oh you sassy whoa where did this come from it was like oh nice 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 oh and then this this sass came out after a year my supervisor was like who are you but i love it you know so give people time it's like any other relationship it has to develop with time um so don't make that decision just based on one interaction with somebody give people time but also honor if you just really i didn't try and this is not we not vibing it's not my therapist honor that at that feeling as well because honestly that might not be the therapist for you and I always tell people like I'm not gonna be everybody's cup of tea and I'm fine with that and sometimes I sense that myself and I like I'm I'm okay referring people like you know I think you would work so well with so-and-so I'm okay with that because I'm human and I want you to be healed. I don't, it's not about me. And it, and, and hopefully you get a clinician that feels that way too. Like this is your journey and I'm in the passenger side. I'm helping you navigate through this, but I want you to win. So if that means winning without, with a different counselor, with a different therapist, let's do it. Let's do it because I want you to, I want you to get this healing. Um, but honestly, just being introspective and like is it me am i the barrier that's keeping this process from moving forward as i um you know do therapy not even just for this initial session but period because sometimes we can be our own biggest blockade um especially in our healing because like sometimes we are so familiar with the pain are so familiar with the trauma are so familiar with the hurt or the dysfunction that when we have opportunities for growth or we have opportunities for healing we push it away and it, it might not even be um something that we recognize consciously it could be like a subconscious thing like I said because I have an issue with vulnerability I have this wall up so when certain stimulus comes to me I'm automatically doing it and I have I, it has taken me being in therapy me being introspective me going before God to say like I need to work on this so I can get my healing so please do not block your healing because you just feel like oh well that session didn't go well please keep going keep going keep going I would also caution um, just like not being honest because I think that that can be super hard, especially when you're dealing with something that you're not even totally comfortable with. And sometimes like you might lie a little bit like, okay, let me tell y'all. How many times have y'all gone to the doctor and they ask you a question and you, you won't tell the whole truth? No, nothing but the truth like you kind of give your rendition of the truth because you're not comfortable telling them what's real but honestly in everything that you are getting help in there's no way that you could really get help if you don't say what it is so like say what it is like if you're not feeling if you're not feeling the greatest say you're not feeling the greatest you know so we can know really for real what your beginning is if i'm they say like on a scale from one to ten how depressed are you if ten is really high and one is really low and if you are feeling at a nine and a half re like seriously report that because that gives us a, a a beginning point for us to have those measurable um outcomes like to say like okay well you started at a nine and a half we're three months in you're saying you're at a seven so you're improving. You're not as depressed as you were. Um, so some general questions that you might want to ask or have prepared either um, when you call to like when you're calling the schedule or in your initial session. So number one, like we said before, like understanding the insurance and the payment, that is going to be so big. Like um, so some therapists don't accept insurance and you only have to pay cash. Um so understanding it like some you might not want to pay cash you might go in with the intent of using insurance but they don't accept insurance so you want to make sure um if they do accept insurance like understanding the copay, um or like if you're getting reimbursement reimbursement um reimbursement rates or if they're in network or out of network like you really just want to understand that before you start um because you don't want to grow to resent going to therapy because it costs all this money that you weren't prepared to pay um 
So just understanding like like what states that they're licensing in, if they're licensing your state, I think this is a big um big one. Now ethically, they should know what they're supposed to be doing. They should make sure that they're licensed where they're where they're practicing. But there has been some like changes to certain things temporarily with COVID, um, and people needing therapy. Like a lot of stuff went virtual um, and online. So just uh, just making sure your therapist is licensed where they where they're practicing. So if you go to like for example like Better Health or um, uh, therapy mode that's online um you might be working with a therapist who isn't in the state that you are in so you know um maybe like the years in their practice or like what they what they feel like their specialty is like I said it is a two-way interview so like what do you feel like your specialty is in, in therapy or you know what well, you know what, what do you feel like your strong suits are? What treatment modalities do you tend to use? Like, those are all excellent questions to ask. Um, asking, like like we said, with telehealth right now being more um, available, like, do you offer telehealth? So if in the event I can't get to the office in person, can we still keep our sessions? Or, um, you know, can we do only um, telehealth sessions. I know some organizations like with COVID, especially like you could meet with people in person, but to cut back on, um, the face to face contact, like we'll be doing like zoom or, um, maybe like, uh, what's the Microsoft teams or whatever, do their assessments where you see somebody on the screen, but they're not in person with you. Um, but also asking like, about confidentiality in those spaces too like is this still the most effective confidential process to make sure I'm you know um my information is not being out there like we want to make sure um so any clinician that is ethical and that is practicing ethically should already be doing their due diligence to make sure everything is confidential and sharing points where it could be some breaches in confidentiality like so for example when when COVID was rampant and we had to do a lot more telehealth services obviously there are some things that we cannot control if the phone hangs up or um if you know if it's a data breach like we can't control that we explain that these are some of the risks but we are doing our best to make sure that everything is confidential and then challenge the clients to make sure that you guys are being confidential as well when you are doing teletherapy so like now i always tell my clients don't be in the middle of walmart doing therapy with me call me back call me at a different session like we can reschedule i want you to make sure that you are focused that you are safe and that you are maintaining confidentiality even for yourself. I don't think you need to talk about your personal business in the middle of Walmart. You know Walmart got long lines. Y'all know everybody can hear y'all because everybody in there. Like, come on, don't do that. Um, also, making sure you are safe. I'm sorry, I'm on my soapbox for a second. But, like, if you are doing ther- teletherapy, making sure you aren't driving or something, like, while you're doing sessions, I know that it could be, like... You might want to do it because it's like I'm driving and I'm trying to multitask, but it's not safe, y'all. We trying to we trying to get you healing. We ain't trying to get, help facilitate your death. Like, don't drive and do no. Be in a safe place. Be in a place where you can maintain that confidentiality even for yourself. Um, um, maybe asking questions like um, the length of the sessions or the number of sessions that they think those might be good questions too. Or just like, you know, if you, if you are just really struggling with something and like, how, how do you think we're going to work towards getting me in a, in a better space? I think that's a great question to ask too. I would just, out of all of that, that I said, these are, like I said, it's not extensive. It's just the beginning of like what the process would look like. Um, but just always keep in mind like that this is your healing and that your therapist is a human being like they they, they're humans they go through stuff too um just be honest just be honest and get your healing get your healing because you deserve it so like always i am your host jazz it has been so great talking to you i sincerely hope that you all are doing awesome and i sincerely hope that if you feel like you need a therapist that you go ahead and make that leap um i'll be here rooting for you and if you have any questions about anything that i posted please hit us up